there's a lot of talk uh, these days about smart homes. Anybody familiar with the phrase smart home? How many of you have an Alexa or a Siri or Google, whatever it's called? I have an Alexa in just about every room. I guess it's called an Echo or I don't know. I just, she's Alexa. She's become a part of our family for that matter. And I'm constantly calling on her to do menial tasks for me. One of my favorites is, well, I have a couple things that'll happen. I got the, the smart light bulbs, the smart switches, all this stuff, kind of affordable around Christmas time. So it's really cool. Um, but at night I say, Alexa, good night. Lights turn off. Alexa, movie time. Lights dim, TV comes on, Netflix opens up, ready to go. In the morning, I say, well, when the alarm goes off, I say, Alexa, stop. Usually very frustrated because who likes the alarm in the morning? And she proceeds to tell me a couple of assigned things that I've given to her, such as uh, what's on my calendar for the day, which sometimes I don't like hearing, but it's necessary to know early in the morning. Um, what the traffic is like to my first stop. And my favorite thing, it, well, it gives a temp also, which isn't necessarily my favorite thing, but it plays my favorite song, which is the song Doxology by a band called My Epic. Uh, check that one out. If you have Spotify, look that up. It's a great acoustic cover of a great hymn. Um, I'm actually hearing it in my head right now. So our culture is fascinated with the smart home and smart devices. But what about the wise house? What about the wise home? We tend to forget that. We, we give all the intelligence to these devices and forget our responsibility at times. So in this section of scripture, I like to imagine Solomon, as we talked about last time I was up here, imparting wisdom to his son, which is the context of the verse. For those of you who are new or first time coming or maybe not familiar with Proverbs, it's wisdom from a father to a son. It's a collection of wisdom. So I like to see this section as Solomon leaving a little bit of wisdom for his son before he establishes his own household. Or at least I see it as wisdom I could have used when I started my household. Uh, the greater context, this falls in line with uh, 30 sayings of the wise. I like to call it the wisest rapid fire. It's just it's a bunch of sayings of wisdom. Some of them stand alone. Some of them have, have uh, greater meaning amongst multiple texts. But all of it is bookended uh, by trust in the Lord, starting in chapter 22, and fear the Lord, ending at the end of chapter 24. So these are the, this is the assumption that Solomon always speaks from, trusting the Lord, fearing the Lord. And we talked about fear of the Lord being uh, the beginning of wisdom early on in our series here. And as we've seen throughout the series, we've seen some, and as Pastor Mike likes to point out, the antithetical elements, this contrast between elements that are opposing. And in this section, we'll see a contrast between the wise and the fool, which is, we've seen quite a bit throughout this section. So Solomon starts this section with a call to wisdom because it takes wisdom to build a house, but also to build a home. So verses three to four, by wisdom, a house is built and by understanding it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So for me, I think of the analogy of, of home construction uh, Travis is familiar with this one. He's involved in home construction, but it takes a lot of wisdom to build a house. Heck, sometimes it takes a lot of wisdom to put together Ikea furniture, much less a house. So we've all, we've all seen that struggle. We all understand that. It requires specific tools, specific knowledge, specific measurements. I have a, um, have a brother-in-law who's an architect. He designs multi, multi-million dollar homes for some very rich and wealthy people. And it's insane when I look at these schematics and like, he showed me one that had a, a, a special room for the cat. Had a little access door from the master bedroom suite into this cat suite. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's something else. But it took knowledge and wisdom to put that together. And when you're building a home, it takes tools, specific measurements to make sure all of this intricate stuff aligns. And a lot of times, for us believers, we need to make sure we're using the right measuring tools in how we 
measure our lives and our homes and how we establish our homes. Some of us fall victim to measuring our homes by the standards of the world. And imagine if two people are working together to the same goal, but both of them have different measuring tapes. What's going to happen in the end? Everybody's going to be measuring twice, quick cutting once, but the, the measurements are going to be wrong. So the very starting point is going to be wrong. And for a lot of us, we fall into that category. Our call as believers is to use the measurement of Scripture, the wisdom that God calls us to, to build our houses, literally, and our homes, literally. Our houses figuratively, our homes, literally the people in the home, our family, our, 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 our network of, of family, every, our church family, all of that requires wisdom for us to build it properly. But the most important element to the building of a home is a foundation. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 7. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, being Jesus. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So imagine building a house on a sandy foundation with the wrong measuring tape, as soon as the wind comes, it topples over because it cannot stand because it wasn't built on the proper foundation or with the proper tools. And the results of a house built with the proper tools, with the proper wisdom that God's calling us to, is a collection of rare and beautiful treasures. And it, that takes knowledge in and of itself to think about this, a treasure hunter. Anybody ever watch, uh, what is it? Well, you Antique Roadshow. What's the other one we like to watch with the the guys that go house uh, hunting for treasure and sell. Um, Storage Wars is one of them. There's one, I can't remember. The Mike is one of the guys. Huh? American Pickers. There you go. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you're here. That's why I needed you. Um, so like American Pickers. Actually, my wife uh, sells on eBay and is quite the treasure hunter. And she brings this stuff like she gets from a garage sale for a dollar and sells it for like $600. Like how in the world did you do that? It took knowledge and wisdom and understanding to hunt for these treasures. And our rooms are filled with these precious and pleasant riches, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but that's the point here is that for us as believers, we need to pursue these ple precious and pleasant, or we need to pursue this wisdom and our house becomes filled with these pleasant and precious riches, a beautiful home, a home built on the strength of wisdom. One commentator offered some uh, contrast uh, of a house not built on wisdom. He said, it is only a snow palace in the winter, but melts away under the power of the summer sun. I thought that was a fantastic quote, and that really tied into the seasonal analogy that Mike's been using throughout this series. It really does. So while one season, this palace built on the wisdom of the world looks beautiful, when summer comes, it melts away. Or Jesus' analogy, when the wind blows, it falls. And great is the fall of it. Solomon says that a wise man is full of strength. And that wisdom is our greatest strength, verses 5 to 6. So he says, a wise man is full of strength, and a man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance, you can wage your war. And in abundance of counselors, there is victory. I couldn't help, hopefully this works, I couldn't help but read this and think about Professor Hulk, Smart Hulk. You guys got to be familiar with who that is. Anybody who's seen Avengers Endgame, it's a pretty popular movie out there. I don't really follow the whole Marvel Universe thing, but me and my boys like watching the movies on occasion. Anybody familiar with Hulk? Incredible Hulk, Green Guy or... You know him as Hulk smash and tears everything up, but he's practically uncontrollable because he really lacks wisdom and understanding. Well, in uh, Avengers Endgame, we meet this new smart Hulk who has sort of um, 
The two used to fight over control of their body, you know, uh, Bruce Banner. I keep wanting to say David Banner. That's a rap artist. Don't, don't ask me how I know that. But the two would be at ends with each other. He'd get angry and turn into Hulk, and he was out of control. Eventually, they were able to bring the two together, and he went from uh, this half-ripped shirt guy to this very uh, intelligent, shirt-wearing version of Hulk. And this is what he says in, in the movie when he meets up with his fellow Avengers and they see him for the first time in this sort of position. He says, I put the brains and brawn together. And now look at me, best of both worlds. So a man that is full, a, a wise man has strength. That was Bruce Banner's strength. And a man of knowledge enhances his might. That's the combination, of, that's the additional strength given by combining wisdom and knowledge you become smart Hulk. You're not just a fool who has some strength, but you're a wise person who has some strength. And anyone who's seen Endgame also knows that in an abundance of counselors, there's victory. I know this analogy, I'm getting carried away with this analogy, but I just couldn't get away from it. If you've seen the movie, it takes every single superhero from the end of whatever universe they're in, (laughs) they're coming through time warps and all this other stuff, to defeat the main villain, which is uh, Thanos, this ultra-powerful guy. So in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. And for us, that applies to our lives. So we have our church fellowship here. It's an abundance of counselors. We have victory over sin and, and struggles in our lives. We have our life groups. If you guys are not part of a life group, this is a good plug for that. I see some of these life groups, and I see how close these people become. I see them hanging out over here, and, and they're networking with each other, and one's sick. They're all praying for each other and visiting each other and doing the work of the ministry on behalf of the church, which is such a beautiful thing to see. So if you're not in one, get in one. Get in the fellowship. Find an accountability partner. However it works for you in your schedule, that is something you need to be doing because in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. But in contrast to this, the fool does not see value in wisdom. Verse 7, wisdom is beyond the fool. Wisdom is too high for a fool. In the gate, he does not open his mouth. This is a callback to chapter 1 when we were uh, preaching through uh, chapter 1, verses 20 to 21 where wisdom is personified as crying out aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. So wisdom can be found at the city gates in this analogy. But quite literally, in those days, uh, the, the city gate was where the people gathered to have civic and legal issues, uh, discussions, and settle arguments and things like that. It was a place where serious conversation took place. It was a place where the fool had to remain silent because they were unable to contribute. So throughout Scripture, the word fool, I know we hear that word now. It's very, it's, you, know, you get canceled for that probably if you use that term to the wrong person. Uh, but the term fool just simply means absence of wisdom in this context. So it's, again, it's antithetical, showing the contrast of the two, the wise person and the fool who has the absence of wisdom. So Solomon, the father, is showing his son how foolish the fool looks in contrast to the wise and really how useless they are contributing to the community in this analogy, contributing to really anything. I think we've all probably sat in a couple business meetings where we feel a little bit out of our, I know I have, a little bit out of my element, you know, a little bit like I'm not sure I should be here, I can't really contribute anything because I lacked wisdom in that scenario. This isn't necessarily speaking to that. This is speaking to somebody who makes no effort toward wisdom, nor does he see the value in in its greater good for himself and others. However, The fool is no dummy, as we see in the next verses. Whoever plans to do evil will be called a schemer. 
The devising of folly is a sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. So the, a schemer is someone who devises plans or plots, especially underhanded ones. So while the fool sees no value in biblical wisdom in the pursuit of God's wisdom and fearing the Lord, trusting the God, he's able mentally, he's capable of planning and plotting and scheming all sorts of evil. So he's not dumb, as, as the term may be used sometimes in our context. He just prefers his sin. He devises folly, devises, puts plans together to do something foolish and sinful. And he'll be called a schemer. He even scoffs at the idea of biblical wisdom, it says here. And this verse says that this person, another word we don't use a lot today, is an abomination. That simply means detestable to God. The person that plots to sin, avoids wisdom, doesn't see its value, despite its call from the gates, doesn't see its value. So our call is to not be like the fool, but to find wisdom and strength to overcome folly and pursue wisdom. For wisdom is what we're called to. Wisdom is what's being, what is calling us as believers and as children of God. And the measure of the wise man's strength can be found on the day of adversity. Everybody in here has met that day of adversity. The word picture of fainting in the day of adversity makes your strength small, means your strength is small. But the evidence of your strength is how you handle adversity. Strength here is the amount of wisdom that you apply. Wisdom would be for us to find our strength in the Lord. But for us who have this wisdom, who have that strength, we have a responsibility. Verses 10 to 12. Now, if you hear nothing else I've said all day, I've been kind of getting to this point because this is where I kind of want to settle in a little bit, is verses 11 to 12. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his works? We have a responsibility as believers because we have wisdom. That's why we're believers, because we're wise enough to see and hear and respond to the gospel call because that wisdom was given to us by God. And as believers, as wise, it is our duty to rescue those being taken away to death. So think about rescuing those those are people who are involuntarily being brought to their death, who, in an unjust manner, of course. It says, rescue those. And it says, hold back those who are stumbling to slaughter, those who are unknowingly heading to be killed. I, I read that, stumbling, fa falling in that direction, not even necessarily sure that that's the direction they're going. It's the fool doesn't see that. When I, when I read these verses, we could easily apply them to any number of our pet political or social justice, uh, pet project, whatever you want to call it. The things that we hang our hats on politically and uh, socially. It could be those things. For me, when I read it, I was thinking about abortion. Think about that. Um, as believers, we're called to rescue those being taken away to death. I, I picture uh, this baby who's supposed to be safe in the womb involuntarily being taken away to death. And then I picture the mother as the one stumbling to death spiritually, stumbling to murder. I spent the better part of the 2010s as a, what they call a sidewalk counselor, I spent years in front of our local um, slaughterhouse, for like, just to tie it into this. I spent years in front of there pleading with these women 
to stop stumbling in that direction. I begged for the life of those children, those unborn children. I've heard things like, you want this baby? Find it in the dumpster with the other seven I left here. I was spit on, assaulted, verbally abused, threatened with arrest. And to see the darkness that overtakes the mind of somebody who can justify such a thing is a hard thing to consider. And I see that as stumbling because I know, theologically speaking, their hearts are darkened because they're fallen. And I'm very grateful to have been the part of a rescue of hundreds of babies, several that I, a few that I have communication with still, or at least can see at a distance, one in particular that I get to see all the time. And to be a part of that, I read that and I go, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. But that's just one part of it. Again, like I said, that's my pet political and social thing. And it's good that I do, did that and do that. And I support those who do that. And I encourage people to do that. But there's a bigger picture here. Even if I saved every baby that went into that place apart from the gospel, it's not worth it. They die spiritually still. What, what profit is that? So while I want to read my, my, my pet political or social thing in there, I have to pull out of it the spiritual aspect of it. And right now, every single day, there are literal blind people, spiritually blind people, stumbling towards their destruction every single day. I picture, I picture a blind man just kind of, he doesn't even have his cane, and he's just walking in a direction. And I know as somebody who can see, because I've been given the eyes to see by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm saying there's a cliff coming. Uh, get out my way, stumbling. They continue stumbling. Just like the people at the abortion clinic, they just continue stumbling in the direction of death. And I'm begging them and pleading with them and describing it to the best of my ability, but they cannot understand it because their hearts are darkened. But as we plead and as we plead by the power of the Spirit, they can hear they can hear the gospel. That's why we preach the gospel. We preach the gospel for those who are heading to destruction so that God would open their eyes to see and repent, turn away, from heading towards destruction and head towards Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let no one go unwarned or unprayed for. That is our duty as believers, amongst all those other things. I'm not, I'm not trying to reduce the importance of speaking out against social injustice or anything like that, but there is something that's greater and that is the umbrella that covers all of those things, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We were all at one point heading to our destruction, and God, by the power of the Spirit, through the preached word nonetheless, because faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God, through the preached word, what we're doing here every day, took the veil off allowed me to see the cliff that I was running towards. And I stopped, man, I, uh, like a Scooby-Doo stop, do, 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 you know? And I, I saw, I ran to the light away from the darkness because now I can see, like the great hymn, Amazing Grace. I once was blind, but now I see. That's what he's talking about. This, and that only comes through the preaching of the gospel. So while it's great to, to do all these things for our neighbors. We should be. Again, I'm not downplaying those. But if it's not bookended by trust the Lord, fear the Lord, if it's not bookended by the gospel, it really doesn't make a difference, does it? 
You might save a baby, but they're still heading to destruction. Verse 12 really drives this home, really, uh, really hits hard. If you say, behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? One commentator commented on this. He said, God will make the fool answer to his folly. But he will also cause the indifferent one to answer for their lack of care. God will render to each man according to his deeds. So you've heard the word today. You can't even say you don't know. You've heard the word preached from the scripture. You saw the verses. You heard the preacher, the spoken word. And my prayer this whole time has been two things. One, that, that you feel a little bit of the weight of this truth. Get a little uncomfortable. That's kind of why we come here. We come here to be refined and encouraged. And, and our jobs as uh, preachers and pastors is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the work of the gospel. So I want you to shift a little bit and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's kind of harsh there, Pastor Rob. I say it in love. I sat there too doing the same thing, going, wait a minute, hold on, this guy's a little harsh. I remember the first time I heard that, I, I was on a podcast and I turned it off. I was like, this guy, how would anybody listen to this guy? And I was one of my favorite guys because he was true. He was telling the truth. He was right. But I also didn't want people to hear this and not see the grace of God in Jesus Christ because while you are still a sinner, Christ died for us. While I'm preaching and you're feeling uncomfortable and feeling a, a hint of condemnation, Jesus covers that. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We don't serve out of duty. We serve out of honor we, we, because we get to. It's a privilege to serve an almighty God without condemnation for our foolishness and our folly and our lack of wisdom and our pursuit of worldly things and, and our unfirm foundations and, and bad measuring tapes that we use all the time because we're still fallen creatures. Our flesh is always at war with the Spirit, and we don't always win. So when I say all this, understand we're still covered in the blood, as they say. But I hope you hear it, and I hope the conviction hits you and you go, hmm, I need to be speaking out. I need to be rescuing those who are being taken away to death, those who are stumbling to slaughter. In, a, in the greater sense, I need to be sharing the gospel because that's my duty. So in closing, the foundation of a good home is the pursuit of Jesus Christ and the wisdom that is found in Scripture. The evidence that you are on the right path is that you avoid the folly of the fool and rescue those who are in darkness, knowing that God will hold you accountable for your deeds. I want to close with this modified quote from Spider-Man 1. Anybody seen Spider-Man 1? I, I told you I don't even watch this stuff, but somehow I just, every time I read it, I was like, hey, that's like this, that's like that. I'm not going to lie, I got this from Pastor Mike. <laughs> well, the part of it. So if you remember at the end of Spider-Man 1, uh, Spider-Man and MJ are at the, in the graveyard, or I think or Mary Jane's her name, Peter Parker, I don't know, help me with all this. Some, some, some Marvel nerds out there frothing at the mouth about to kill me after this. But they're together in, uh, I think, a cemetery or something. And Peter Parker makes the decision that he needs to part for her, for her safety and for her good. He needs to part with her and be Spider-Man. So I modified his quote. I think, I think it's good. I think it's good. He says this as the credits begin to roll. Whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. With great wisdom comes great responsibility. This is my gift, my privilege. Who am I? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. That's my little modification there. He's, he's Spider-Man, of course. But we're followers of Jesus Christ. This is our gift and our privilege. So it's time for us, like Spider-Man did, boy, this analogy is weak, but like Spider-Man did, he parted 
with MJ, even though it was really hard for him because he loved her. We need to part with the foolishness of this world and pursue our calling in Christ Jesus to rescue those who are perishing. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. When I hear the word, when I hear the word pastor before my name, I I, I shudder because the calling is so great and I feel so unworthy and unable and I don't feel as smart as everybody else. And and I struggle with imposter syndrome. I, I don't know that I belong here half the time, Lord. But by your grace for the last almost two decades now, you continue to use me to preach your word and hopefully to bring glory to your name. I pray today that those that heard this today feel a pool to be a part of one of the greatest gifts in the world, and that's to preach the gospel and be a part of redemptive history, to be a part of your redemptive plan to rescue those who are perishing. I pray that as they're doing that, they find more freedom in you, that the grace that you offer, even the vilest of sinners, is beyond comprehension. The fool can turn from his folly. And we can turn from our sin towards you. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you that it is by grace alone, in faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, so that I don't have to boast or that I can't boast because you're the one who did it from beginning to end. Let us look to the cross where our sins were bore and let us see that salvation. Let us leave our sins there. Let us look to the grave where you rose as proof that Jesus was who he said he was and that the, that the payment was paid and that we have no condemnation because we are in Christ Jesus. Let us not be found in Adam, in our own sin. Let us be found robed in the righteousness of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.